Hello once again, everyone. And I have to say, I love the topic that we are going to be getting into today. And I mean that fully pun intended because our topic is going to be love and relationships. As we navigate through this conversation today, I actually want you to think about this in two ways. Uh, the first is probably the most direct way that we're going to be speaking, which is really how is it that we can sync you know, into greater love and that space of love within our relationships. And of course, we're going to talk about some of the challenges and struggles along the way uh, of how we go about doing that, as well as the good news that there really is a path to doing this. And there, there's a lot of practices we can take on as well that allow us to open up much more and bring uh, that space of love into our relationships in a, in a much more meaningful and much more impactful way. But the second thing I want you to consider just as we navigate through this, this chat today is that this also speaks to the way that we relate to pretty much anything, because this is also about being in relationship, not just our closest relationships. So while that's going to be the primary context, just keep it in the back of your mind that there's a whole lot more going on in this conversation. And so to do that and to get into this conversation, to support us in such a way, and honestly, it's, it's my honor, it's my pleasure to be able to welcome Susan Piver to One Idea Away. Susan is the New York Times bestselling author of nine books. You may have already run across Susan's work. I hope you have, including her most recent book, The Four Noble Truths of Love, Buddhist Wisdom for Modern Relationships. Susan's been a practicing Buddhist since 1995 and graduated from a Buddhist seminary in 2004. Internationally acclaimed meditation teacher, known for her ability to translate ancient practices into modern life. Her work has been featured on The Oprah Show, New York Times, uh, many, many others. And in 2011, she launched the Open Heart Project, which has become the largest virtual mindfulness community in the world. Uh, I can say for myself that the topic of just modern mindfulness is one that you guys know that we touch on on a frequent type of basis because I believe in the impact that it can have on our lives. And we truly are honored today to have one of the foremost teachers in this space with us. So with that, Susan, thank you so much for joining us here. Oh, thank you. That was a lovely introduction. I'm glad to be here. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. You know, I, I guess maybe the, the starting point as a just kind of a nice just softball question would be, you know, why isn't it that we can't just have the easy fairy tale relationships where we <laughs> fall in love and then that's where it ends? <laughs> yeah, why can't we do that? Why can't that happen, right? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, you I, know, the real answer is I don't know. <laughs> right? I, I don't know. Yeah. But it just is much more complicated than falling in love because what happens after you've fallen in love and what happens after the romance and the initial, you know, totally amazing, wonderful, real thrill subsides. Yeah. What happens? So, you know, if you look at 99% of relationship books, as far as I can tell, they're about how to get love, how to bring it in, how to keep it, how to make it come back, how to attract it, and maybe 0% are about how to love. Mm. And there's something missing, I think, in our social view of love, our cultural view of love, that it, it ha it's something that should be easy and make me happy. And sometimes it does, and sometimes it is, but yeah. uh, what, ha what happens when it isn't? You know, I think that's, it's it, tying it to that broader um, kind of cultural and, and societal view and, uh, certainly the the view of of love that we get when we turn on uh, turn on the TV or watch a movie uh, is a little different than than the actuality of it and I one of the things you go into which I think also is a is a wonderful frame for us to consider uh, around this is this idea of I think you refer to it as romantic materialism and and I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about this because it's it you know just for everybody as, as, as kind of the frame it's this idea that you know there's this one true love, this one true relationship, and everything just seems to fall into place for us. And I was wondering if you could expand on that, because that seems to be one of the, the major false notions that we, you know, spells almost that we fall under with, with the input that we're receiving from all different angles. Yeah, spell is a good word. Yeah, you know, materialism is, I want to acquire something so that it will make me happy. And in exchange, I will give this. So it's yeah. when we apply a transactional view to love, it is puts us in the wrong ballpark. Mm -hmm. You know, luckily we're wired 
many, most of us, not all of us, to, to fall in love. And then it's, that is truly amazing. But we think, and it's real. I don't want to make it sound like, oh, that's a, a weird illusion that you have to get through mm-hmm. to get to the real stuff, because it is real stuff. But we, it doesn't end there. It doesn't end with, oh, I've fallen in love. This is amazing. It ends, it continues to, I've fallen in love. This is amazing. And now all my problems are solved. So when most of us say we want love, I don't know, I'd be interested to hear your observation of all the people you talk to, but when most people say, I want love, they don't really mean that. They mean they want safety. They want to be somehow out of the flow of human experience and immune to suffering. I, I honestly, when I, when I read your perspective on, on this and, and can the connection sort of that love somehow equates to, this safety, this security, this uh, warm, fuzzy blanket, so to speak, that we, we really are after, I, I think there's an tr- extraordinary amount of truth to, to that sentiment. Uh, because, you know, that t- honestly, when we look at, as you said, some of the materialism, even when we say we think that buying this, getting this, attaining that, achieving this is going to give us happiness, happiness for most of us is is actually just again also another word for i'm going to feel more safe i'm going to feel more secure i'm going to feel more content uh and just kind of wrapping ourselves within within that space and it just doesn't stay and relationships is our very direct equivalent to to saying that in the security space or the feeling safe agreed Um, and i'll add one thing to uh, then i'll feel safe then i'll feel all these things i want to feel i would add and then i will like myself but until these things happen, I, I cannot like myself. I, I do not like myself. Yeah. And that's really the biggest you know, thing that we're looking to resolve, the biggest issue that causes pain, I think. And absolutely, and I, I, I would also add the language, as you say, of I will love myself. It is also sort of a feeling that having that love, having that relationship somehow makes us whole in a way that we're not without it. It's as yeah. if we were missing something, right? Yeah. At least that's and what we feel. It's true. And, and weirdly, sometimes it does make us feel whole. And, that, sure. and, and, that's, and often it does make us happy. And it does make us feel complete. But that's not all there is. But then when we try to freeze in those moments, like hold on to those moments, right. then we stop seeing the person we're in a relationship with. And we just start seeing the thing that we want to get from it. And that's the materialism mm. part. Mm. That's so. That's another part of this, and I know this is going to move us kind of into the, the the noble truths as well, because it's part of this perspective of love is so much more than the giving and the receiving of it. It's this this much you know bigger experience and, and connection that we have, and yet when we approach it from the materialism or consumerism sort of feel, it does become more transactional, and we start thinking about how can this one relationship solve all of these needs that I'm feeling. And exactly as you said, as opposed to seeing the person in front of us, we're just seeing it as a, as a, a vehicle for how we can continue to try to make ourselves feel better, feel more connected, feel more fill in the blank. Agreed. And, and then it's, it's so weird because the closer we get to someone, the less we are actually apt to see them. And the more we see, this makes me happy, this makes me unhappy which is, those are important things yeah. to note, yeah. really important. Yeah. But that person is not a vehicle for delivering one or the other. It, yeah. in, we, but we tend to treat our loved ones. I mean, I'm not saying I'm any different, but, so, <laughs> but we tend to treat our loved ones as a vehicle for good or ill. So maybe, maybe let's use that because, you know, it was one of the things that, that I appreciated so much about the way that you wrote the book and very specifically the way that it came about was you know when you teach and when you share you share from a very authentic personal space as well um it, this is not you know uh, uh this is what i've you know come down the mountain to come share with you uh <laughs> this is a very real experience and i was wondering if you could just share a little bit of of how the four noble truths of love came about sure yeah, yeah. thank you for asking i as you mentioned in the introduction i'm a longtime buddhist practitioner and the whole Buddhist path is built around the Four Noble Truths. I, so when I, this, at one point in my marriage, and anybody who's been in a relationship for longer than like six months knows this, there are periods where it's, oh, this is easy, this is great, and then it stops. You don't know why. 
and then it's not easy and everything is complicated and difficult and then that ch ends right. and something and i don't know what governs these gale force winds but i was in one of those stages with my husband where we could not get along like no matter what no matter what either of us said the other one was hurt or angry even like crazy simple things like do you, do you want dinner could, well, <laughs> that was a bad question to ask during this time and this went on for months it was terrible and we were avoiding each other we tried talking we tried not talking we tried everything we just didn't like each other yeah. so one day i was sitting at my desk and i was just crying i was like maybe it's over maybe it's over i i thought we loved each other but it's, i don't know and at that moment, like I, a voice uh, came into my head, my own voice, presumably, that said, um, begin at the beginning. At the beginning are Four Noble Truths. Mm. So I thought, oh, that's great. That's a great idea. And then I thought about it for another moment. I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> what did you mean by that? Could you go into a little more detail? So I started playing around with the Four Noble Truths, thinking about them as Buddhist teachings and how they might apply to our relationships mm -hmm. and came up with the four noble truths of love. You know, one of the things that you're, you're describing there, I don't think you specifically used it as this word, but it's one of the, it, it, as every listening, you guys know, I, I, I've also deepened my own mindfulness practice over the last about six years or so. And one of the, you know, simple concepts to understand and one of the most uh, difficult to truly do uh, is the idea of staying. And I think that's that's something that's very interesting, Susan, in, in the path that you just described, that the personal experience of what led to this is that that's also a period of time that for many relationships, they don't stay. Mm -hmm. And they, they don't even get to the deeper exploration that you went to that yielded <coughs> this type of work. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it's yeah. appropriate to leave. Absolutely. So that Maybe. it's not, yeah. And especially, I, I, I like to add that if there's abuse or addiction involved. Yeah. That's a whole different, I'm sure your people who are yeah. listening know that, but that's a whole different thing. So I just don't want anyone who's in a relationship that involves abuse or addiction to think, oh, some Buddhist lady told me I should stay. So Absolutely. No, that's a different category. But otherwise, yeah, it, it's, you yeah. know, yeah. sometimes it's, it is easier to opt out and sometimes it's the right thing to do for yeah. whatever reasons, but that's part of the mystery of it. We don't I, know. I think what's interesting with then the, the, the truths themselves as you lay out is that it gives a path of staying to the point of being able to understand what's there. Mm -hmm. If that makes, if, you know, if that makes sense to everybody, right. Is, is it, obviously that's a, an incredibly difficult decision for anybody to make is the, do I stay or do I go, especially when it comes to, to our intimate relationship. Mm -hmm. And this actually provides a path to and a, and a means of exploration for us to sink in to deepen into our experience and understand what's there and then come to the decisions that we may need to come with you know come to uh, at that point and so if maybe we use that because the actually let me let me frame it this way because i want to go to the first noble truth of, of love because i think it's one of the it, it's an important base truth <laughs> of what we're talking about here um to do that, though, if you would if you would just step back a little bit to include what that emerged from in terms of the first noble truth from Buddhism, uh, kind of the original way that was there, mm -hmm. simply because I that notion of suffering uh -huh. is one that is I think uh, very misunderstood outside of uh, the Buddhist community of, of what's really meant by that. Yeah. And so, if you could share a little bit of that, and then obviously what that led you to in the realization of relationships and the nature. Sure. Of them. Sure. Yeah, it's misunderstood everywhere in the Buddhist community too. <laughs> yeah, true. And I'm not saying that I hold the sole definition, but I'll tell you my understanding of it. When the Buddha became enlightened, he went to his posse and said, I'm enlightened. They're like, oh, what did you learn? And he said, I learned four things. And the first noble truth around which the entire Buddhist path is built is often uh, said as life is suffering. But my understanding is that the word that is being translated, dukkha, is not, that's not the best translation. A better word is unsatisfying. Life is unsatisfying. 
nothing. And what this truth points to is the idea that there is nothing to hold on to. Everything changes. Nothing is permanent. And that is painful. So whatever arises, an idea, a structure, a relationship, a word, right. it will arise, it will abide, and it will dissolve. And that is very hard to reconcile with. That's yeah. the first noble truth. Yeah, it's the the uh, one of the you know, beautiful quotes, and I, I I'm going to attribute it to to uh, Chagyam Trungpa, and you you may correct me if I'm wrong here, but it was the I know the notion of uh, you know life is very much like kind of falling through the sky with no parachute, which is the bad news. Uh, the good news is there's no gr there's no ground. <laughs> yes, that is, a, yes, that is a, one of my favorite quotes of all time. Yeah. And it is, it's, it's this free floating experience and, and getting comfortable with being in the fall or even the freedom of that, depending on how we want to orient ourselves, uh, is very much what this journey is about. And the minute you get comfortable, you can get thrown out. <laughs> yeah, right. So right. You know, can you get, it, it, it's just crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That's, my, that's my assessment. <laughs> and so then the, the, the nature of that, led you to uh, kind of the, the nature of relationships, the, the yeah. first truth that is there. So if you could, if you could share and elaborate. Sure. That. Like what is the, okay, if the first noble truth is life is unsatisfying, well, relationships are unsatisfying. Well, is that true? This is the thought process I was going mm -hmm. through. Well, no, sometimes they really are satisfying. Mm -hmm. So instead of keying on the satisfying or dissatisfying aspect, I keyed on the permanent, impermanent aspect. Yeah. and came up with relationships never stabilize because I'm pretty sure that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just are continually changing. Like as the first noble truth of life says, everything is always changing. Well, the relationship is always changing too. And that is painful because we want to freeze it in some moment of perfection or excellence. And then, stay and that is literally never going to happen yeah. so now what now what where do we go uh, it, to me that was a liberating thing to realize it was, how does it, it strike you uh, well it does because it was when i was reading through it what struck me and and you know multiple ways but on the on the very logical side uh what just struck me was just simply that you know, we as individuals are always changing. The, the person I am today is not the person I was yesterday. I'm, it's not the person I'm going to be tomorrow. And so if I'm always changing and the person I'm in relationship with is always changing, there's virtually no way that it can be stabilized. Right. You know, it's as if you're, you know, if you're, you're standing holding hands and, and you're both on two train tracks going down the road, those trains are not going to be moving at the same speed a hundred percent of the time. It's going to move. It's going to shift. Right. Yeah. And the world around you is changing. Exactly. Exactly. So, so even the train tracks are changing. <laughs> exactly. So it's not like how can you smooth this ride out? Yeah. It's how can you like loosen up yeah. a little bit? And you know, I can't remember what metaphor I heard of some sport. You know, if you or a glass, if you mm. if you drop a glass of porcelain, it shatters. But if you drop a lacquer glass, it just bounces. So mm. you know, can how can we take the, the lacquer path? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's from the sports standpoint. I wasn't sure if this is where you were necessarily going, but it's one that that I've used as as kind of an, an image here is that idea of surfing, because the waves are always going to change. They're always going to break. They're going to move in different ways, and so we can't always take the same path. It's not going to work that way. Balance there doesn't mean standing steady. It actually means being able to flow with whichever course, whatever direction it happens to take, and be present yeah. in it. It's a totally good, totally, totally good metaphor. And it reminded me when I was young, I, I was a, I did, I did gymnastics. I was a gymnast in throughout high school, and one of the first lessons was uh, keep moving because uh, yeah. if you freeze, you're going to fall on your head. <laughs> yeah. So you literally, it's it's weird. I, anyway, mm. if you're going to do something like a back handspring, you can't do it halfway and go, oh, how's this going? You have yeah. to like commit and just do it. Yeah. And uh, but if you stop in the middle, then it all falls, you literally fall on your head. That's a very interesting analogy as well. Um, I think the, the, the other thing that struck me is you were explaining the, the first truth and, and kind of going through this idea that relationships are, are not going to be stabilized. 
what it brings, and you alluded to it, that we, you know, there's this almost like this point in time that we want to freeze. And it speaks to that idea that we want to hold on to, we want to grasp, we want to cling to something. And we want that to never, ever end. You know, we, I'm sure we've all had those moments with our, our dearest relationships as, as well as just those moments in life that we want to hold on to those forever. Mm-hmm. And that just simply can't happen. That's just yes. not the way life works. <laughs> I'm sorry, you can't. I know, it's a very painful thing. Yeah. Life is suffering. It, it's painful. But and that, then what? Exa- so then what? So let's, let's go to then that, that second noble truth. The second noble truth, so the first one is relationships never stabilize, they're uncomfortable. Sorry, I'm gonna get my hair out of my face. Um, the second noble truth is thinking they should be stable or comfortable actually makes them unstable and uncomfortable. So instead of sort of riding the wave to use the, your surfing metaphor, you sort of look at the wave that you're on and you go, I don't like that wave. Mm-hmm. I want a different wave. Again, sometimes that's appropriate. but The second noble truth is thinking that they're going to be comfortable actually contributes to the discomfort. So what if you showed up in your relationship, whether it's your romantic relationship or professional or familial, and just thought, I don't know what to expect. You know, the Chogyam Trungpa, as you mentioned, has the best definition of patience I ever heard. It's like, here's the formula for patience. So if anyone's listening, struggles with patience, here's how you cultivate indestructible patience have no expectations. <laughs> and having no expectations, all you have is patience. So of course we have to have expectations. We're human beings, we live in a world where we expect people to be kind to us or tell the truth or whatever it might be. So I'm not saying don't have those, but look at the expectations and ask, how much is this the root of my unhappiness? Yeah. What would happen if I just loosened their grasp on me for a moment? Well, it, it leads to, you know, when we have that expectation that our relationships are going to be comfortable and from that comfort, you know, or, it, or it's going to be comfortable, it's also going to be stable. And from that, that's how I'm going to feel safe and secure. What then happens is if we hold that belief too firmly, what I believe you're, you're saying and to, to elaborate on is that we then try to effectively coax and coerce our relationship, uh, even if it's in a wonderful, kind way, but to try to fit it to some image, some expectation that we have in our mind. And that's the ways in which we might try to very politely and wonderful and lovingly change our partners, <laughs> right. right? And, and change their habits uh, or, or put these constraints, these rules on our relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where, you know, where you're saying is that the more that we do that, that's just going to create more strain, more stress, because the relationship, much like life, is never going to perfectly conform to that. Yeah. Yes. To a point, because I want to add please, something to that. Please. Because especially for women, there's this idea that I, if I say what I need or what I want, then, you know, that's too demanding or that's a problem mm. or I should put you first. Or yeah. if I think of myself, I'm being selfish. <clears throat> a lot of people feel that way but especially women and so this is not saying don't think of yourself Mm -hmm. this is not saying don't have expectations for your relationship because you should yeah you should you should expect to be heard you should expect to be loved you should expect someone says they're going to show up on time they show up on time and just the human decency things but when you're getting upset what are you getting upset about? And mm. are, are you getting upset at your partner? Or are you getting upset because your expectation wasn't met? Often mm. it's some combination. But who are you thinking of in, in this upset? Are you thinking of yourself, which is fine? Mm-hmm. Or are you thinking of your relationship, which is not the same as thinking about yourself? So mm. it's a dance. If you're thinking about yeah. you, thinking about me, and thinking about us, which is different than you and different than me. Yeah. So when your expectations are thwarted and you want to employ an antidote, which is fine, what, what values are governing your actions? Mm. So the values of love or values of need, mm. you know, just to oversimplify. 
I think that's a, again, it, it, it's a powerful um, understanding for us to sink into because uh, I, I, you know, very, very much uh, agree and, and did not want to, to cut short in that we do have certain things that we uh, may need to speak up about and, and be able to voice for ourselves. I mean, we still have our own sovereignty uh, in this, in this whole process. We don't surrender that by, by any means. Um, and the, the ability for us to have multiple ways of exploring what's really going on for us by looking at ourselves, by looking at the other, by looking at the relationship as a whole, looking at what is truly the, the values of the relationship, what are the needs that might be expressed, what are the fears that may be there to really identify where is this pattern, this stress, this dissatisfaction actually arising from because it may or may not have anything to do with your partner. <laughs> it's true. Right. It's and true. it may, it might, but that's it may right. not. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And how and much it, am I going to hold you hostage to my yeah. inner experience? Yeah. You know, for, I want to bring you into it. I want to share it with you. I, it, I want you to, it is your business, yeah. but there's a fine line between relating lovingly and deploying a manipulation of some kind and it takes a big mind to see to see which one you're doing and i'm often it, wrong it's interesting because you then describe in, in the third truth you talk about love as meeting the instability together yeah and I, i'd love for you to elaborate on that but where why reason why i'm connecting it here is that you also then bring in this notion of the container principle and there's a very practical way that you mean that and a very practical way that you go about that. But even in the conversation we have, we're having right now, it also seems like you're crafting almost an energetic container for the exploration and the understanding to, to unfold. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that question a lot or that comment. Um, yeah. The third noble truth, with meeting the discomfort together, the instability is love. <clears throat> it refers to this idea that when when things become unstable, when two people they look at each other, they go, this you did this, you okay, yeah, I, I, I you're right, I'm sorry, and, and that's good. That's that's necessary, and that's good. If you have someone who'll do that with you, that's really good. But I think a great relationship, in addition, includes. I'm using my hands because I'm going to use <laughs> going to deploy them Appreciate in this explanation. You. Is someone who will turn shoulder to shoulder with you to yeah. face and see where you are on this ride. We love, now we love each other. Now we don't. Now you love me. I don't really love you. Now it's the opposite. You know, someone who will see the arc and just not let go of your hand, you know, metaphorically yeah. speaking, as you go on this really intense ride. Yeah. Um, that's, to me, that is love. Not feeling love, which is great, but having that kind of a way of relating together to this thing that you're creating, which who knows what it is. But the container principle in the Buddhist teachings I've received says that the space in which something occurs changes the something, mm. and the something changes the space. So the simple analogy is if you meditate on a bus, it feels different than meditating in a church. You know? yeah. You're the same, the meditation is the same, but the space has changed. So when you pay attention to the container in your relationship, and as you said, it, it can be very just practical down to earth. Mm -hmm. Like, what is your environment like? What are you caring about what it looks like? Not from a fashion point of view, but so that it is welcoming and invites love. And what are you eating? Not so you should eat a clean diet, quote unquote, I hate that word, I never wanna hear it again. <laughs> but do you care about, you know, when you care about someone's physical well being and the food mm. they eat and the things that we wear, not that you should do someone's laundry or they should do yours, but just some sense of caring individually for those things, just those things, what you eat, your home, your clothes. Yeah. That creates a sense of upliftedness that 
uh, infiltrates the way you communicate with each other. And yeah. so those are simple everyday things yeah. that we tend to rush through or not, not appreciate for their power, mm -hmm. but they are quite powerful. Absolutely. I, 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 I really, it, it stood out to me because it, as you said, it, it can be everything from the, the, the practical, um, the way that we support each other nutritionally and environment wise and clothes and just these, these, these relatively uh, simple, not simplistic, simple um, ways of supporting one another. There are signs that, that something more is there. It's like, it's, 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 it, like you said, I, I'm trying to figure out if there's a different analogy there than, than just simply the creation of the container, because there's such an energetic effect of uh, having the signs, having the support around you that consistently signal the way in which you guys are in relationship with each other and the respect and the value that you have for each other through even just these either small actions or additions to your environment. And that supports, and especially if they're in line with then the values that you may have as a relationship and, and otherwise, it continues to provide this space so that when things become unstable, exactly as you said, uh, we've got a, a space that we feel like we can retreat into mm -hmm. um, energetically as well as physically mm -hmm. that allows us to, to navigate through what can be some very challenging times. I completely agree. And I love that you point to the energetics of it. And the energetics are rooted in caring. Yeah. <clears throat> so this isn't about like, you need to be healthier. Sure, we all need <laughs> to be healthier. But what do we do in our lives? What, basically, we wear clothes. Yeah. We eat food. We sleep in a room. Okay, well, what are you doing with those things? Because those are the basics. Yeah. If you care about those things and you care, the caring, I just, this I sound woo-woo, but I feel like the caring goes out for me and starts to imbue my yeah. surroundings. You can feel when someone cares about their surroundings yeah. and about how they feed themselves. And when you care, I care about your experience of those things. Then we create an environment of caring. It's mm -hmm. not about excellence. Mm -hmm. It's about caring. And that caring, when you can't care about each other, because sometimes you can't, you don't hate each other, well, then you're in a world that's been cared about. Yeah. So it gives you space yeah. to, rec to regroup. Well, I, I, and this is where, and I, I, I honestly, I, I don't remember whether this specifically came up under the third or the fourth truth but it was this notion of good manners, uh, yeah. right? Because it's, it's, you hear that phrase and immediately, you know, your head goes one way of what, what you may mean, uh, what, what somebody might think it means. But it speaks really to what you're describing right now with caring because when I read this idea of manners, it gave me the notion of our manners, our way of treating each other are signs that I value you and you matter to me which would just be another way of saying caring in, in what you just described. Absolutely. Right. It is another way of saying that. Yeah. Manners are a highly underrated spiritual activity yeah. <laughs> because, and you know, we're not talking about which fork to use particularly, but manners are predicated on thoughtfulness. Like you actually think you mm. use your mindfulness, not just to be like, calm yourself down. Yeah. But to take the other person into your awareness and then think about, well, what is their experience? And mm -hmm. wh what might they feel like when they come home today? And why do they like this, but not like that? Well, let me, re I'm not saying I'm going to do what they want, but let me at least remember that. Yeah. So in the Buddhist view, the spiritual path begins with establishing a foundation. We must establish a foundation. And the foundation is established by Things like simplicity, you can't practice 10 things at once. <laughs> Discipline, you have to you know, be pretty regular about it. And renunciation, which is a scary word, just means <laughs> renouncing bullshit, not renouncing fun things. <laughs> <laughs> so what, is the found, what are the foundational qualities of a relationship? Well, I put good manners right in there because if you're in a relationship with someone that can't think about you, yeah. well, what is going on? You could have a great love affair. Yeah but it'll be hard to have a relationship without that foundational quality of thoughtfulness. Yeah. Moving then into, into that fourth truth, which uh, is that path to, to liberation, um, the path of mm -hmm. uh, potentially, I guess, maybe surfing the instability as, as we've kind of framed it today. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly elaborate on that, but you, you point to, to three specific things of precision, openness, and going beyond uh, within this mm -hmm. path. 
And I was hoping you could elaborate there um, because it ties into specifically one or two of the practices I wanted to ask about as well. Yeah, sure. So meditation practice itself is composed of those qualities. Yeah. It's precise. You place your attention on something. In most cases, the breath. That's it. Very precise, very one pointed. The second part of the instruction is the practice is you relax with yourself as you are. You soften. Very profound. That third, that second gesture. The third gesture is you let go. Things come up to distract you. Thoughts, no problem. Meditation doesn't mean stop thinking. It just means relate differently. You let go. Let go. Let go. Let go. To come back. So applying those phases to relationships, the precision piece, the foundational piece, because if you're not placing attention on breath, you're not meditating. If you're not placing it, working with attention on something, breath, you're not. You might be doing something perfectly great, but I wouldn't call it meditating. So without that, yeah. without good manners, you can't have a relationship. That's my point of view. And without honesty. And honesty doesn't mean just blurting out what you think. It means knowing what's true. That's, that's what I mean. And then the second quality can arise, the uh, open piece, which is uh, quite shocking. It's uh, recognizing that you're not the only person <laughs> in the relationship. And uh, that was, that's on, I'm making a joke, but I actually was quite surprised yeah. to realize that my relationship wasn't about me, you know, primarily. It was, there's someone else there. Yeah. And can I view him? in my case, heterosexual relationship, can I view him as having at least equal importance to myself? Not in my mind only, but in my actions, yeah. in my heart. That, that's really useful. And then the third piece, letting go. You know, in meditation, you let go and there's a fresh start. You let go and there's a fresh start. So I'm not suggesting in relationships you let go and just go okay, whatever, that's the past, now let's just start over again. It, in the letting go, in the spiritual tradition, that's where the moment of enlightenment exists. It doesn't exist in your intellect or in your efforts. It exists in the letting go. So every letting go is a moment of wait, potential complete wakefulness, according to the theory. So in a relationship, the way that that applies is instead of viewing everything that happens between you, as this is a good sign, this is a bad sign. I mean, it's important to note those things, but you could view everything that happens between you as an opportunity to deepen intimacy. Not love, but intimacy. Because love ends, comes back, goes away. But intimacy has no end. You never get to a point where you're like, we have shown everything because you don't even know yourself. Mm. So, when I realized that, I thought, okay, I, I, I don't know if I can do it, but I can commit to trying. I can't commit to love. I know that's BS. But I can commit to revealing more and opening more and doing my best. So that makes a powerful relationship. Intimacy yeah. is the, uh, you know, the uh, secret sauce. Yeah. You know, the, the, the point about openness first is... is you know, that we view our partners um, as equal uh, to, to us. It's one of those things that, you know, like, like you said, it, it didn't mean to be a surprise, but it sort of was a surprise. Uh, it's, to me, it's just this, this wonderful return point. Like whenever you're, you're right, you're dancing through the, the ups and the downs of what's going on. It, unfortunately, at times, as individuals, as human beings, it can be pretty easy to get lost in ourselves and lost right. in our agenda, right? And our egos and, and our stories and everything else. And this is one of those moments that even though it sounds like, well, of course I believe that. Yeah, try it on for size. That's right. <laughs> right? Agreed. Okay. Okay. Do it. Let's see that. Do it. <laughs> and then when you compare how you're showing up to this belief, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's like, okay, maybe I've got a, I, I got a little adjusting to, to do there. Right. Uh, which also, again, to me is part of the precision is being precise in the way that you look at things and, and being open to looking at things that way. Um, yeah. Okay, can I pause on the word ego for a second? Yeah, please. Because please. that worries me sometimes because yes. I think people mm -hmm. think that means I shouldn't be me. I shouldn't, yeah. if, if I want something and I don't get it and I'm upset, that's my ego talking. And, and that, I, that's, that's, I, that's not what's meant. That's not yeah. what's meant. So it's not like you shouldn't have wants. You shouldn't have expectations. You shouldn't be hurt when you are. You should 
and it's and people get well i'm so attached yeah. it's my ego that creates attachments and i would like to say that is bs attachment is not a problem it's not a problem because if it is then you're attached to non-attachment and then you just boom you just booted yourself out of the whole game so just go with it go with yourself be with yourself and don't attach to the past yeah absolutely thank you for that mm -hmm. um and then it's this this point about intimacy uh, which I think is just a wonderful one because when we sink deeper into intimacy, you certainly also talk about vul vulnerability, which is uh, you know a key part of that process as well. As we move into that, you know, any of us can reflect when we've been more intimate, when we've been more vulnerable. What more often than not has resulted from that, and more likely than not, it's been an experience of love or a ver certainly a very powerful experience within our lives. I agree. Uh, closeness that is mm. you don't just wake up and find one day that you have you you build it brick by brick and it's yeah. it's everything yeah and and that to me and this will sound maybe a little um you know a little off path but it goes back to when i inter you know introduced the show or opened the show today is that there's also something here in the background that is not only about our intimate relationships, our personal relationships, but about the way that we relate to everything as well as to, to others that might be more friends and acquaintances and even strangers in our lives. And that intimacy is part of this, is that when we, within the right environment, with the way that the relationship gets navigated, when we find those little steps forward to be more intimate, which means be more close, and, and more open with those around us, it's amazing what happens to those relationships. Mm -hmm. And I'm not it saying, is. right, I'm not saying jump into the deep end of this, you know, take, be comfortable, be safe, be where you are. But when you open up that way, just you feel a different connection to those around you and you feel that greater connection throughout all different areas of your life. Yeah. I, I think going also back to another thing that we began with, yeah. I think that's why it's so difficult. Yeah. You know, you said, we fall in love. Why is it so hard after that? Mm -hmm. And I think what you said is why, because we struggle with our feelings of vulnerability yeah. and willingness, unwillingness, fear, understood. Yeah. But that's what makes it difficult. So I know that we could continue this conversation for quite some time, but I, I do want to be, you know, uh, watchful of, of where we are here time-wise on the interview. So I guess maybe to start to bring things around full circle, one of the things I was curious about is this, the mindfulness community that, that has just blossomed in what you're doing. And you specifically named it the Open Heart Project. Mm -hmm. And so I was hoping you could just speak to a little bit of that, that open heart, why you chose that as the core focus. Yeah. I, it sends, I think, a really critical message for where we are right now. Oh, I appreciate that. And uh, yeah, I, and I also appreciate you noticing, noting that it's the largest virtual mind community, yeah. mindfulness community in the world. However, I would like to say, I believe it's also the only one. So <laughs> just, you know, full disclosure. Either way. <laughs> Holds true. But it, yeah, it has got, you know, there's almost 20,000 people that meditate together. It's quite mm. extraordinary. Um, I named it that because I just woke up one morning and with my own practice, noticing my own practice now more than 20 years, maybe 25 years, actually. I, that what has happened for me over all that time is, it's not comfortable particularly, yeah. but my heart has opened. And the, word, the phrase I woke up with was, open your heart to change the world. So it's our fear of ourselves, our fear of other people, our fear of the world that causes us to create harm for ourselves and others. So even though it seems like in order to avoid suffering, I should shore things up, Actually, the way to alleviate suffering is to open further. And, you know, it's not a mystery that Buddhism is associated with compassion. It's like, well, how does sitting there doing nothing on the ground, you know, yeah. meditating lead to this? Well, it just does. And what does our world need more? Not that people who are nice, because compassion doesn't mean nice. It means awake. It yeah. means awake so that you can know what to contribute. So that's my hope of what I can help people discover through meditation. Yeah. I think it's, you know, as uh, one of the first people that I certainly ran across using the term was Jack Cornfield, 
uh, was this idea of speaking to the, the, the notion of the warrior's heart. Mm-hmm. You speak about it in this book as the spiritual warriors, uh, which mm-hmm. certainly to be, uh, seem to be at the center of the, the open heart community because there is such extraordinary strength and courage to be found in staying and staying with an open heart uh, and opening ourselves and opening our, ourselves to the experience of life, uh, mm-hmm. to all those that we share this life with. Uh, and there's, it's that balance of, of the, you know, that, that courage and bravery that it takes. And it's also the gentleness and the kindness and the vulnerability mm-hmm. that's also within that space. It's this kind of wonderful duality. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like that's very much what's being cultivated in the community you're running and, and certainly just purely across the intention of, of your work. That is my intention. Absolutely. Perfectly named. Thank you. Outstanding. Susan, I, I really appreciate you being here. Just before we wrap up, maybe I guess I would just love to, to ask, maybe where is your intention? Uh, no, I'm sorry, not the intention. What is your hope for the work that you're doing today? Meaning if you were to take this out 5, 10, 15 years, what is your hope for what this can cascade into, what this contributes to for us? Mm-hmm. Uh, that's such an awesome question. My hope is that people of like minds and like hearts can find each other and support each other to live in this courageous way. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I would say also being a woman and a woman Buddhist teacher, there's a, I would really like to emphasize the sort of female way of doing spiritual practice, which doesn't mean you have to be a woman. It just is a a non-linear way of practicing. And I would really like to support people to opt out of the the way we're told to do things and learn things. I know this is kind of vague, but the Four Noble Truths of Love, as far as I know, is the first first book about relationships ever written by a Buddhist teacher who was a wife, mm-hmm. you know, a partner, because the vast majority of teachings come from monastics, which is not yeah. great. Yeah. But my ultimate hope, and this is my answer, is that to help people see that what they're doing right now is their spiritual practice. Your life is the path. You're doing it. You're in it. It's sacred. It's magic. Wake up to it. Susan, thank you. For, for being here on One Idea Way. Thank you for sharing this work with us and, and the community that you're building because uh, it is very much having a, an extraordinary impact. Thank you. you know, for everyone, I, I, I can't really sum it up any better than that. So I'll just reiterate this idea of approaching our lives, approaching the relationships within our lives as our spiritual practice. Uh, we, uh, it, believe me, it's beautiful to get that time and space to be able to meditate on a mountainside. I love those moments. And my practice and where the kind of the rubber meets the road for me is when I'm getting up in the morning and me and my wife and my kids are running around and all our different, you know, things that we've got to get done for the day. And it's how can I be there? How can I really be present? And how can I use the, the everyday moments to just deepen this experience and understanding of life uh, with every passing day? That's beautiful. That's fantastic. I support you in that wholeheartedly. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, everyone, once again, for dropping in on One Idea Way. And until next time, continue to enjoy the journey. Check out IPEX Coach Training Program at ipeccoaching.com slash OIA. And of course, to find out about all the conversations, events, gatherings, all the things that we've got upcoming, then head on over to oneideaaway.com forward slash community. Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed it. And if you have, please do us the favor of subscribing, reviewing the show, as well as sharing insights or comments that stood out for you in this episode.